LaRouche is a political news media place. You can find hot button issues from their perspective and discover coverage that you may not see on the networks. My position here on this show is to keep open your eyes as to what others know and believe and how they represent the facts. So let's meet LaRouche representative Dennis Speed, committeeman and national spokesperson. Dennis Speed. Hi, Dennis. How you doing? Good. Long day. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm so happy you managed to <laughs> stay alive long enough. And thank to you have for you coming, on. by the way. From that's a nice little trip you yeah, had sure. there. Thank you for making it. Yeah. Okay. So first, tell me what it is that you do for LaRouche. Maybe you should say what is LaRouche first, so you can help us out. Yeah, we're Maybe I wasn't about the complete. LaRouche Political Action Committee. Now, a lot of people may know who Lyndon LaRouche is, or may not, but he's been around for over 50 years in American political life. I hmm. uh, first became famous on the college campuses during the Vietnam War uh, because he was talking about the instabilities in the e economy at that time. And many uh, people, such as myself, heard him at that time describe events before they occurred. A lot of us became very interested in how he could do that and why he could do it. Uh, so in the period of the 1970s, he founded a publication called Executive Intelligence Review. And what this publication became known for is printing stories about events that seemed to happen six months or a year or two years later. Um, and people have always been mystified by that, but the real point is I that- Don't mystify anybody. Well, <laughs> the way he puts it is that, you know, if, if you don't know what the future is, you're probably a failure as an economist. And he doesn't mean that he, has, he reads tea leaves. He just means he can identify processes and tell people if you keep this process going in this way, this is going to be the result. You'll likely find a result. result man. Yeah, exactly. And, and the last time I saw him do that, which was a particular note, was in July of 2007, when he gave a, a speech, was in Washington, uh, in which he stated at the time that the banking system was going to collapse, that it was finished, that the mortgage market was finished, that no one could actually repair it. And what was going to happen is that in the subsequent months to a year, you were going to have a collapse. And then that happened September 15th through 18th of 2008. Okay, um, remember my education is gonna be, it's thorough at times and sometimes limited. But what I do remember in this particular situation relating to that event mm -hmm. is that before, I think it was Dowd and who were the uh, politicians at the time? Dowd oh, and uh, Fried, Frank, Barney Frank and Bar uh, Frank and Dowd put that through the the bill they put through. That Bush had warned them that securities backed mortgages was a dangerous path to take. That was in 2007. He made that speech. I'm wondering if Larouche didn't identify, learn from, or no, it was earlier. Go from then. No, you see, because what happened with this thing was is rather useful to remember the history of it. What had happened was that you're referring to mortgage-backed securities, right. and that's what everybody said the problem was. And to this day, people believe that that's what the problem was. The actual problem was located in uh, places like AIG, which if you remember, yeah. yeah, we bailed them out even though they were a private company. Right. It's completely against the law. It wasn't a, even a bank. It wasn't even an investment firm like Lehman Brothers, which we also were not supposed to bail out. We bailed out AIG because AIG had uh, about $80 billion that they were on the hook for, but more importantly, they had something called credit default swaps. Now, we're not here to go through a lot of the background of this stuff. I just want to point out that there was a game. People were told it was the mortgage-backed securities. It wasn't. It was also the mortgage-backed securities. Was it securities-backed mortgages? No, no, mortgage-backed securities. Yeah, because what they did was they took mortgages from regular houses and so on, bundled them, right. and they said, since everybody's got to pay their mortgage, right. we'll issue a... a, a Credit a, a lien? No, a, well, basically, no, a security. They created a security yeah. out of a bundle of mortgages and, and they there. bought and sold those. Hmm? Hmm. Now, then what they did was they said, well, of course, you know, we're, people are always going to have mortgages because even if the people that can't pay get moved out, new people will come in sure. and take their place. Sure. All right. So the next tier of, uh, of, of fiction was to say, well, how about if we insure this? Because after all, if we say that we will make sure that if any of this market really fails, we'll come in uh, and, and we will backstop any losses. And that's what we at AIG will do. 
then what happened was they turned around and turned these into financial instruments wow. as well. Wow. Yeah, Double and that's, and that's what happened. And, and so we, um, what we were looking at, we were looking at this process way before it got to that point. We'd been looking at that process ever since 1993. It was called, they were called derivatives. Yep. And it was something that basically we had been writing about in, in our publication, Executive Intelligence Review. And that's what I mean. So it appeared to people that when LaRousse said this in 2007, it was like some kind of magician. Mm -hmm. It wasn't. It was that we had been following this for 14 years. Matter of fact, LaRouche in 1995 had created an illustration. It, it was technically, it was a mathematical function, but it wasn't with a lot of notes. When uh, did he start to follow that? Because I'm a little bit lost here in the time frame. Well, what happened was that, see, he he first, with respect to the derivatives I mean, market, it was the 1990s. On this one issue, but I'm it's okay. about well, it. Well, it's yeah. okay because it's yeah. relevant to the whole sure. thing that LaRouche sure. really does, and this is why he seems to be mysterious. This is why a lot of people say we don't really understand what he's doing, right. but it's also why he's been so crucial and out in front of everything that's happened in the society. Uh, the first time I saw him do this was 1971. I happened to be in college at the time, and he was talking about what was then called the Bretton Woods system. This was a system established exactly 70 years ago, seven zero years ago that this familiar. month. Yeah, well, this is the system that basically uh, Franklin Roosevelt put into motion during the Second World War, which was the way in which the dollar became the basis of all world credit. That was a system at which we had the dollar at $35 to an ounce of gold, and it was that way from about 1945, roughly 45, 46, to August 15, 1971. When I went to school in college, they had a textbook uh, authored by an economist by the name of Paul Samuelson. And in Eck 101, they said, that the Bretton Woods system was unique because it had built-in stabilizers and it could never fail. And I remember this because I took Economics 101. LaRouche, when I met him, was in a debate with another economist and he said in the spring of 71, the Bretton Woods system is going to collapse. Now anybody who was taking economics at that time remembered the statement yeah. because this was sort of completely at odds with what right. we were being taught. Right, right. And in August of that year, it happened. Mm. So from that time, I've seen this, but the ability has to do with the fact that if you spend time focused on trying to figure out what productive activity is, as opposed to non-productive activity, you begin to get a pretty good picture of why uh, nations fail, why economies fail. So for example, today, the United States economy is a failure. It's a failed state. We do almost nothing productive any longer. We don't produce food much. We don't produce steel. Manufacturing. Manufa we, have, we have mining. Right, right. We, we, we have virtually nothing. And, and as a consequence, China has now become actually the most powerful economy in the world. Right. Now, it's not the most powerful monetary system in the world, but it's the most powerful economy. That could be reversed, and the United States could do this any day. Uh, if it followed something that LaRouche has just come up with, and I guess that's the one thing I'd really got to make sure I get in. Sure, sure. LaRouche wants, first of all, a reinstatement of the old law that Franklin Roosevelt had passed in 1933, which was called the Glass-Steagall Act, just named after two right, legislators. I remember, that, I remember that. All it was was you separate out the speculation from real production. So people come first. Well, that sounds reasonable. Yeah, and, and the speculators just take a bath like they're supposed to, which is what should have happened in 2008. We shouldn't have bailed these people out. Instead of having a total recession. That's right. The second thing you then do after that, step two, is that you have what's called national banking. All that means is we have a U.S. Treasury already. You issue, uh, you can call it credit, but for very specific purposes, like, for example, a subway system, a high-speed rail system, water projects, power projects, things that you are tangible. No blanket uh, That's right. Problem. Precisely. Okay. And what you do is similar to the kind of thing that Lincoln did with the greenbacks back during the Civil War, where the concept is once you use that currency for that purpose, you burn it. You literally only have it in circulation for that purpose. Uh, so that's, that's credit, and that's national credit. Sure. So it, doesn't, it doesn't mean you nationalize everything. It just means there are certain things that you have used to kickstart the economy, and you, know, and that's that's, you use the taxpayers' money yeah. for that. The third step uh, from that, having st established that, is you issue the credit and you put people to work in infrastructure projects, largely, of various types. And you have sort of a first tier, and they're pretty obvious if you look around New York City, you look at the roads, you look at other things. 
But then finally, what LaRouche has been talking about is that we have to have a science driver like the Apollo project. When we, had, when we went after the Apollo moonshot, most of the benefits were on Earth. And whether we're talking about the pacemaker or we're talking about Arms various use. other things, right? Well, Tang, right? Yeah. Everybody remembers that one. Um, well, all, these, all these things are digi digital. Well, for example, the cell phone, cell phone all of yeah. that technology, right? Sure. Came out. So you, you sometimes will pursue a project. In this case, we like the idea of what's called thermonuclear fusion power. It's not the hydrogen bomb. It's the idea that Eisenhower had of taking the power of the hydrogen bomb and using that for Ener power plants. Energy. Yeah, for energy. And what's great about that is that these, this, uh, the only Cons waste consumer product Consumer energy, is, not just industrial. Yes, and what, right. And what you, what you do, it's the process that goes on in the sun. It's basically the same exact process, which we have to study anyway for various reasons. Um, to understand what's going on in the sun itself. But what's important about it is that the only waste product is seawater. More importantly even than that, if you actually master this, and this has been being worked on for 30, 40 years in different places, different portions of the world. Russia's worked on it, China. The United States has had a lot of projects on it. But if you did it as a crash program, then what you can do is you can collaborate not only with people around the world, but bring back our engineering capability. Sure, Our that'd be nice. What about the uh, pipeline? That'll help bring back something too. Well, what you what you want to have is a lot of, a lot of the things that we would have, like of the fossil fuel variety, would then be transitional to a shift into a completely clean source of energy, assisting uh, the energy to provide new thermonuclear product right. for the okay. So well, right, in, in, in other assist words, fashion. Well, you could even phase out nuclear power plants. See, what you would be doing is you start off with your atomic plants as we've generally seen them, except S safely. The sound of that for John Q. Public isn't going to come out well. I know. That, but I'm say that's why I'm going through it. Because what you've got to have is a 15-year crash program where you're transitioning. Because in other words, you have a lot of old and technology. And you're saying crash because you expect that there's going to be a lot of rebuttal against it. No, I'm saying a crash program because when you do crash programs, you get things done. It's like what Kennedy did with the moonshot. At the time, remember, as he oh, pointed yes, out. We're going to be out before the end of the decade, and they just snuck right. it in. Right? That's right. right. And, you, and they, they, just, they just got it. Yeah. But, but by doing that, all the other spin-off technologies that developed, we even had a nuclear rocket program at that point, which was intended to not have the big chemical it rocket. It was the rockets. one where Van Braun was involved, right? Van, well, Van Braun Van was Braun. the one that actually helped do the Apollo shot that actually ultimately did work. Yeah. Um, he did do some designs on the nuclear rocket business, but uh, people like... Um, Edward Teller, uh, who was one of the people who was involved in the h -bomb. he and others were working on this. And but many of the Russians, a guy named Sokolovsky, some other people worked on it as well. This, what I'm talking about is not really futuristic at all. This was all stuff that sure. was basically well known mm -hmm. in the late 60s and the early 70s. But we just walked away. We sort of went, we de-industrialized, we shut down all of our factories. We destroyed our why educational isn't anybody, system. You're right. Why isn't anybody taking up that charge? Just to, to go back one exactly, second. Exactly. The reason is what we started with. You've got these characters. And let's start with our president, mm -hmm. uh, who is, uh, I think, a disaster. And I think he's a disaster, not only as an individual, but I think what he represents, the whole outlook he represents. Why? Because instead of investing in the United States, instead of disengaging from the speculators, and we're talking about a lot of people on Wall Street. I get what you're saying right there. Instead of, instead of doing that, yeah, I get it. you yeah. see, and, and going with people first, e even in the way that Roosevelt did it, and which, is, which is the way to do it, he didn't do that. And he betrayed the people that trusted him. I, I didn't trust we him. We could go back and claim some responsibility for other presidents as well. Well, you could say that I think you could say the same thing for Bush 43. I think you could say the same thing for Bush 40. I mean, a lot of people, you could say a lot for a lot of the presidents. I'm not really blaming the presidential system. No, I think system. in general they're figureheads. Yeah, because they have a lot of power with their Wall Street. You have this problem of Wall Street and the city of London, which the city of London, I don't mean the town London. The city of London is just a term that Euphemistic refers to the financial term. district of mm -hmm. London. And it's between these two, also you have some other old money in there coming from the Netherlands, so-called Anglo-Dutch money. For example, to, just so people understand that, all of the oil is traded on the Amsterdam spot market, you see. So when you talk about Royal Dutch Shell or some of these other comp companies, yeah. you're, you're talking about sort of an incestuous arrangement. This is what we have to break. This is not an American arrangement. An American arrangement is us developing our people, our nation, in collaboration with other individual nations that want to work with us. 
It's a state by state thing. It's not us having armies all over the world and destroying uh, countries all over the world and getting involved in a lot of conflicts we don't need to be in. Is that the libertarian perspective you're talking about there? Well, no, I, I, I call that a LaRouche perspective. I, I no, think the there are libertarians. Uh, well, yeah, that's that why they, they, that they have, they, they have yeah. a sort of people that call right, them isolationists, right. but my view is that there isn't really a reason, as someone has once said, why are American troops deployed more than 500 miles from the United States border? You have drones, right. you have nuclear weapons, you have right. all kinds of, you have satellites. Well, that can much more easily be said in the last five to ten years than yeah. it could have before that. That's so right. We learn slowly, you know that. Yes, yes, yes. But at the same time, I think our people are prepared. And this is what we find in the street, as I think some of your viewers may have seen some of our people out on the street. Yes, me. <laughs> yeah. See, so we go out there, we do, <laughs> and, and that's what the political action committee is really about. We have a candidate uh, now uh, not running May for office. May I say office. something about the pe people sure. in the street quickly? Sure. I have got a relatively unfortunate, weak feeling about the, some of the people on the street. Uh -huh. um, you seem to be well spoken about the issue. I think you can carry the ball a little bit better than they can. Um, questioning them seemed to be far more difficult. I'm used to questioning people, and I was disappointed uh, on the responses I got, so I walked away from that possibility. I'm glad that I reached Diane. I'm glad my, uh, my uh, crew member Don here referred me back to meet you because at least now I got some answers because well, I couldn't you know, get the, I couldn't get the answers before sometimes people have bad hair days some people have yeah. bad brain days you know I mean, no, it, this it, is it, about 15 different times how many different di bad days can uh, you have I don't know you I'm know, starting I, to get I, a bad track record on some be, of these guys it might, it might be something I don't know it was something in the in the air I, I have no idea well I was there a lot and I talked to them okay back okay. I'm sorry go ahead yeah so anyway the idea as I as I said was you we have uh, we've had a we have a policy committee policy committee and Diane is a member of the policy committee mm -hmm. and and what their job is is to bring clarity to these matters and quickly a as an example we want citizen action and we recognize that a lot of citizens are working three jobs four jobs nine who knows what right they don't have a lot of time so we try to pose a few matters that are rather straightforward like take 9-11 a report got issued by now former Senator Bob Graham of Florida. And one of the chapters of the report was missing. But the senator says there's nothing that is of classifiable nature in the report. But what missing. the report does say, the report does say that the Saudis financed 9-11. So the families of the victims of 9-11 of New Jersey were demanding of the president, Obama, that these pages get released. He promised, this was in January of 2009, that he was going to do that. So we began a campaign, and Diane was instrumental in this last year, saying, why don't we just get these 28 pages? I mean, whatever they say, they say. You know, and and nobody, nobody, we're not claiming we know exactly, but the senator is, is illustrating or indicating that this would actually give a completely different view of 9-11. And so this is a campaign that we're very much involved with right now in conjunction with some of the families of the victims. You know, as soon as you talk about stuff like that, there's going to be uh, an air of conspiratorial nature exactly entering why. the picture. Right, and that's exactly why you don't start, start talking about how the buildings fell and yeah, whether right. the planes were real and all that kind of thing because, right, anybody can have any view. That's why we said if a U.S. senator issued a report and Part of that report the has been censored. The least you can do is identify what that was. Yeah, yeah. That's all. If, if it got censored and he's saying it can be released because it's not classified, what's the problem? See, so by leaving it at that, you don't have to commit yourself to any particular view. Maybe the report says Osama bin Laden did it, and that's all it says. Well, you're going you're gonna to create, by using too much language in that area, another conspiratorial chain. There, but you don't have to do anything. What right. I'm saying no, I got is what you said. No, yes. I, I'm just saying if you did, that's right. what that's would right. happen. That's exactly. And right. so I'm, I'm giving that as an illustration because how people would get involved with what we're doing, you know, is always a big okay. problem. Okay, yeah, okay. Now you have a lot of volunteers. Yeah, we do pretty well. Okay, yeah. uh, and you've been in existence in the 60s? That's when he started. Well, yes, when Lynn LaRouche started. So when he, did you... He had, uh, he had various political action committees, but the LaRouche political action committee was largely the product of the past 10 years or so, a little okay. bit more. That was because a new generation of young people got involved with LaRouche. That was sort of, sort of an interesting story. You know, LaRouche is 92 years old. And about 12 years ago, he took on this project. He's 80 years old. Great. Of, of recruiting 18-year-olds and 19-year-olds. And I, I was privileged to be at a couple of these things, which were pretty wild, because you have these two or 300 people who are like a, fifth of, a, a fourth of his age who were there. 
right? And he was just going yeah. back and forth with them for hours. So that group of people needed a political action committee. They didn't have any affiliations. They had no Republican Party, Democratic Party, Libertarian Party, Conservative. They had no affiliations. Ah, uh, for the moldable youth. Ah, uh, so what happened was <laughs> that the conception was, okay, let's have a LaRouche political action committee, and this will have policies. And so we'll advocate policy. So he has a group, small group, of five people, and they are in charge nationally of the front line of policy. Diane's one of those people. And uh, actually, I'm here because she couldn't be here tonight. Yeah, right. That's okay. You're doing a great job. Don't give it up. So the point being uh, about policy is you need to make policy statements. You need to back up and support yourself as best as you can. Um, what would you highlight film the policies to be? Yeah, that's true. But there's also another thing, I think, in the United States. I, I find and have thought, found this for a while. There's so many people in the United States that are so dissatisfied. They don't know exactly what happened. They just know that whatever it was, it was Wasn't bad. good, yeah. It was bad, all right? I know so, the same feeling. I know that feeling, yeah. Yeah, right. So, so I think people are very open to the idea of challenging all the bad things they see going on. You got it. And yes. that they're willing to take a few steps if you can make those steps accessible uh, We're to on board with you, okay, go so ahead. That's, that's the kind, so that's why we take something like Glass-Steagall, which used to be law for 66 years, it worked well. They abolished the law in 1999, then the speculation really took off, and all we're saying is put the law back. So that was abolished in? Yes, in 1999, November of 99. It was being worked on, it was being weakened for about six, seven years from the beginning of the Clinton administration, and then in 99, it was actually repealed. And what what is we must adopt four laws? Well, the four really four laws. The first was the reinstatement of Glass Steagall. That's the first. The second was the reestablishment of the United States Treasury as the center of our banking system. Oh, that is of national banking. Okay. Rather and, than well, rather than the Federal Reserve, Federal Reserve for example, yeah. which is now pumping out you know eighty five billion dollars. Yeah, whether we're in debt or not doesn't seem to make any difference. Right. I know. Exactly. Right. The third is the issuance of credit, which is earmarked credit for productive purposes. I used right, water, power. Do you have to uh, use the word earmarked? You know well, why I say well, that, right? You could say designated. You know, yeah, all right. Know. Yeah, you, you know, know why you, I said that. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. You're right. I understand. You say designated. Okay. Um, so, but that's really so that you don't, you can't take it and speculate with the with the credit. That's the main point. Well, that's and, a huge oh, yeah. and wise and very simple idea. Very simple. I think it just works. Yeah, and, and then the, the fourth thing would be the um, crash program, energy programs, and particularly we're talking about thermonuclear fusion power uh, because it can be achieved and because it would end the fossil fuel problem, the oil issue, for example, the coal issue, and all the Why things would they, that people There's so much money about. involved in it. How would you stop it? That, uh, that process, the oil for ah, the interest that that's well, that's the essential reason that we don't have fusion now. That's true. Right. You have to have a you have to have a lobby. You have to have a a popular lobby of, in my view, people in their teens and twenties mm. that have to decide that they want this. You won't get it any other way. Won't won't happen. Sad state of affairs. Um, does that mean that people are older or less mobile or less pliable in their brain? No, I think that. You know, you have an interesting process because the boomer generation is sort of now all in retirement and they sort of, many of them were politically active or whatever, in one way or the other, whatever you want to say yeah. about their particular politics. The younger generations have sort of been essentially sort of intellectually disenfranchised. They've never really stepped out on their own. You can't push people to do anything, but in a period of crisis, I think if you give them ideas of policy and let them make choices, that you'll find that you'll get exactly what you need from big, those young people. We only have a couple of minutes left, believe it or not. This, uh, this time has gone really fast, sure. but that is a very unique uh, idea. I think it has merit. We were just talking about that moving uh, people's minds is something we really need to do at younger stages of life. Yes. But w it does seem like the millennials and people that are in their 30s and 40s, up before the baby boomers, um, I'm a baby boomer, one of, the, yeah. one of the first, as a matter of fact, but we, don't, we haven't had much success with them. We don't know why they're falling away. They're not getting married faster. I'm talking about generationally, we're losing our millennials to uh, ineffectiveness. I don't know what else to put it. Well, Either I, they think, get lucky I think they don't have they don't. a sense of a future. I don't think that you can give them a sense of a future the, unless you have a productive society. Our, our uh, base 
programming is done for families in transition. As uh -huh. a mediator, we do mediation for families, and we think that uh -huh. we think the families in divorce rate is so high that the millennials are the first major generation to grow with only one parent. Yes, yes, yes. And, and that I think is causing uh, some some kind of missing element in the missing parent. I well, first of all, I agree with what you're saying. I mean, and I, there was a lot that one could say about that problem. I find that we all have to do something in the educational system, and we can't do things like Common Core. Oh, you got to do. I'm with you on that. Yeah. You know, you got to do. We just things. finished the Common Core program. You missed oh, okay. it. <laughs> well, well, you know, so I mean, you can't yeah. do that kind of a thing. No. Nope. But um, whether it's intensive music studies, like the old style with chorus and things like that. Shop. Yeah. Yeah, that's also extremely important. Anything physical right. is a crucial thing. We've taken the engineering aspect of things that can be manufactured, built, created, usable minds, yes, that kind yes. of thing away. Exactly. And said, here, you can go get the big job, but you're just using a pencil. But what it also does is it creates a sense of mental alienation uh, uh, on the part of the student. Uh, and, and, and you need something physical to really ground young people. Sure. So, I mean, I'm an athlete, so most of the sports I can uh, use in my life would mm -hmm. help me support my, uh, get my energy out so mm -hmm. that I didn't have to worry about over... But what you go back to is the thing you said about shop, that's crucial. Yeah. Or even things like geometric construction, where you actually make different uh, sure. forms shapes, and builds, shapes yeah. like that. Yeah. So th this is what we, what, and essentially it's sort of a return to what you could call a classical education, mm -hmm. away from all the uh, innovations that we've seen in the 60s and 70s and on. Okay, in our last two minutes, uh, give me a little sum up here of what you're about. I know that you've already done a, a sure. quite a good job here, but I only have two minutes left on my sure. uh, time Okay, well, just this. We're, we're on the verge of a really dramatically bad situation. I mean, we've got uh, uh, impending war, could even go into thermonuclear if we're really crazy enough. So, you know, it's the 100th anniversary of the First World War. You know, August of 1914 was when it started. Wow, didn't think of that, yeah. Yeah. Now, we, on the other hand, as a, as a, we can remember, 70th anniversary that of... Ferdinand got, was a, yeah. That's the date they, they say yeah. is the start. Exactly. Yeah. And so what we've got to do is walk our country back from the brink of those kinds of crazy societies toward the American system that we had. And I believe we can do that in our time. And that's what the Political Action Committee is dedicated to. Okay, so I, I thank you very much. You did a fantastic job. I'm glad you made it for that long trip. I appreciate it. No and uh, we'll think less conspiratorial about all other things, not only what other people may be saying about groups that are like yours, but I'm familiar with um, groups that form and, and have a sense of conspirat mm -hmm. conspiratorial nature within mm -hmm. them. This sounds very plausible. You did a wonderful job. Thank you. Societal and political trends are rapidly breaking on the family that once was a cornerstone of our great American culture. At FIT, we know you cannot get the information on your own, so we'll see you again next week. Ciao. Thank you.